Good afternoon. My name is Tracy Nyer, and I'm with the Virginia SBDC. I'll be your facilitator for today's webinar. For those of you who are not familiar, the Virginia SBDC is the largest and most effective provider of customized counseling and education for small businesses in Virginia. Most of our services are offered locally in 28 locations throughout the Commonwealth. Today's webinar is one of our educational offerings and is part of our ongoing webinar series, Google and Beyond, Marketing and Managing on the Web. Today's topic is Getting Found on Google, Search Engine Optimization for Local Small Business. All of our Google and Beyond webinars are presented by Ray Sidney Smith, a web and mobile strategist, author of So Low Mo Success, Social Media, Local and Web Small Business Marketing Strategy Explained, and President of W3 Consulting. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type those questions into the question window and Ray will do his best to answer them. Without further ado, here's Ray Sidney Smith. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you to the Virginia SBDC for having me here on the webinar series. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. Obviously, if you have questions, we've done this topic before. I think we did it last year, so it's, uh, maybe more than six months ago, and a lot has changed. A lot of stuff has stayed the same, but if you have questions, please, this is the time to ask us those questions. Feel free to follow me at W3 Consulting, and feel free to ask me questions on Twitter, hashtag it beyond Google, and I'll know that it's about the webinar series and be able to help you uh, better that way. Also follow at Virginia SBDC to learn about upcoming webinars and other programs that they have for you going on throughout the state. So uh, something that some of you may or may not know from prior webinars, I'm a Google Small Business Advisor. My area of specialty is in productivity, so productivity software like G Suite and so on and so forth. Uh, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask those questions. And as well, there is a community, free community for small business owners. If you go to g.co forward slash GSBC, the link on your screen, you'll be taken to a community page. You log in. You can ask all kinds of questions that you have about Google My Business, which we'll be talking about today, Google AdWords, Google Analytics, Google Sites, you name it. If you have a question about Google Small Business, they are there. There are experts as well as other Google Small Business Advisors like myself there in the community to help you for free. All right, so just know that that's a resource available to you for small businesses on the Google platform. So to get started today, I want to just talk about some of the stats that, that I think we should all be paying attention to as small business owners. One is that the vast majority of Americans are on the web, right? We're talking 80% saturation rate sort of nationwide where you have metropolitan centers, what we call MSAs or CSAs, metropolitan statistical areas, you have upwards of 90 plus percent saturation of people who are connected to the internet. Okay, so almost everyone is on the internet in some way, shape or form. And I think these numbers are actually rather low in the sense that some Americans may be connecting to the internet, but they say they aren't because they don't have internet in their home necessarily. Okay. Uh, and uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm on this sort of uh, bandwagon that small business really deserves broadband, both wired and mobile broadband access throughout the United States. So right to your senators. <laughs> Next up is that there are nearly 80% of all search are done using Google. Okay, that means whether it's desktop or mobile and now via Google Assistant on, you know, Google Home and via other devices, most search is done using Google's search engine. Now, as of March 2017, Google still dominates, you know, they cover 80.52%, I think, of all search globally. Uh, the, the next closest competitor is the China-based search engine Baidu. And most people don't know who, what, who or what Baidu is, but almost every Chinese national does. Um, they have about 6% of the global search market. Now, then if you combine Bing and Yahoo, they both come in right about 6 or 7 and 5% of the global search market, and that gives them a whopping 11% percent, maybe 12 percent of the global search market when you combine the two of them together. I typically b combine Bing and Yahoo just because of the fact that they both use the same um, server sort of farm engine and algorithm for being able to push traffic. There are some minor uh, differences, but I tend to lump them together into the same category. But so you have Google 80 percent, Bing 6.9, Yahoo 5 
5.3, I think it is, uh, Baidu running at 5.9, and so you can see the vast chasm between those people who are using Google for primary searches and everybody else, okay? And that's unless you're in Russia with Yandex or uh, Naver in South Korea or uh, Zainam in Czech Republic. I mean, those are the really, really the only other three of the four countries that have a dominance of using something else other than Google, okay? So Google dominates search. If you didn't get that idea already, really, Google dominates search. <laughs> and uh, more than 60% of those searches are done on a smartphone, okay? And when we take that into account, 40% of those searches, then if we take more than half of the searches are done on a smartphone, and then 40% of those mobile searches have some kind of local intent involved. And this really comes down to why local search engine optimization is so important for your small business because 40% of those searches is basically coming with the intent of some kind of local, you know, local concept in mind. What am I, what am I intending to do? I'm intending to do something in my vicinity or in the vicinity that I'm going to be traveling to. Finally, we learned that of that 40% of mobile search traffic, 88% of them either call or go to the business within 24 hours of that search, okay? So we have, a, we have a vast majority of those people who are actually trying to do that. Now we have all kinds of other statistics that show us that if they come to your site and they don't have a good mobile experience, if they come to your site and they don't get the information they want, they will go to your competitors. So we know that they're fickle and we need to be able to address their issues and provide them value so that they will use our products or services before they'll use a competitor's. Okay, I just wanted to go over those stats so people are aware of really the impact, the effect, really, of the search engine Google on your business bottom line, and most of it being mobile and local intent that's really making that, that affect, okay, or effect. All right, so today what I'd like to do is I'd want to talk about where and how to position yourself on Google to get... Your, your sort of best first, first impression uh, to Google and to your target audience, and, and that way you can get the business before a competitor. Uh, we're going to talk about optimizing your web presence so that you're looking good to Google, and we want to make sure we know what kinds of tools and metrics are available to them. There's some really cool ones that are out there so that you're able to get some of the stuff, stuff done uh, a little bit easier than we used to be able to, you used to have to do in, in the sense of having to crunch numbers and having spreadsheets and so on and so forth. Today, the tools really do make it a lot easier. I'll leave some a uh, couple of minutes at the end for question and answer, and we'll go from there. All right, so let's start with positioning on Google. One of the really important things I tend to think about when I talk about positioning on Google is the difference between organic and paid uh, positioning, okay? Organic means you're putting in the work, right? You're earning that traffic as opposed to paid, which means you're advertising or sponsoring in some way, shape, or form in order to be, be seen on Google. When it comes to organic, we have web pages and blog posts pretty much that allow us to be able to be seen and to be elevated on the Google engines search engine results page, what we call SERPs. Uh, so the search engine results page, or SERPs, are going to generate traffic because people do the search, they end up on the search engine results page, and then they click on a link and that's either direct, directing them to your website or blog post, okay? And when we talk about website pages, remember that your website is a, is a compilation, a collection of individual pages. And each of them, while collectively stand as your website, each of them is something that needs to be optimized for Google, right? Because if someone does a search today, uh, let's take the, the very um, sort of uh, very new sense of asking Google Assistant, whether you're asking that through Google Search app on your mobile phone or asking Google Home or asking it through the desktop web browser because you can ask questions by voice using the Google Chrome and Google Search engine. And so I'm sitting at my desk, I click on the little microphone that Google Search gives me on the Google Desktop web presence, and I say, how do I, you know, um, or where do I find a dentist in Arlington, Virginia? Uh, Google is going to then look for a page 
an individual page on a high ranking website for that particular keyword, which is dentist, right? And they're going to then look for uh, that based on geolocation. Where? Arlington, Virginia, right? They're going to navigate to the United States. They're going to then look in Virginia. Then they're going to boil that down to Arlington, and they're going to look at the various criteria, the ranking factors, local rank factors, to be able to surface that individual page or post that will answer my question best. Okay, so while while we tend to want to think about our websites as a as a full standing publication on an, you know as a whole, we really need to start thinking about how these things operate functionally as individual pages as well as how they connect to the greater whole. Next up is Google My Business. This is literally getting on the map, right? The, the Google My Business is and used to be called Google Plus Local, used to be called Google Places and several other names. Either way, it's all now bundled under the Google My Business brand and you get to it by going to google.com forward slash business. And so if anyone has any questions about that, I'll try to answer the ones that are more general here on the webinar, if we run into questions that are of more specific to your situation, I will have my email address on the final slide. You can email me and or we can take it to the Google Small Business Community and have someone maybe who's more expert in one particular category or another who can help you there on the community platform. Next up are videos. Video is so important today to positioning on Google and it's another ranking factor that I think a lot of small businesses think that they can't or uh, or don't know how to really uh, gain access to and really it's all about the value of the content okay and so if you're if you're thinking about you know really ranking well on Google think about ways in which you can use video in order to be able to position yourself on Google well YouTube is typically the platform that I that I tell businesses to use that could be YouTube putting it onto youtube.com, but also using YouTube as a hosting platform and then embedding the YouTube video on your website so that you're actually ranking for your website. Now that's how I would probably tell most people if they were looking for local search optimization is to take all of your videos and set them to what are, what's called unlisted meaning that it's not found on YouTube at all. If you did a search for your, your you know, video, you wouldn't find it on YouTube. What you would need to do is you need to search on Google in order to be able to find the web page, the individual website page that has been local search optimized with your video embedded on it. Now what that means is that Google sees that page it sees that there's a video on it that's embedded, and it knows that the page is about that particular keyword or key phrase because of the way in which you've optimized that page, and we'll talk about on-page SEO in a little bit, so that you're able to then garner more traffic from the search engine Google than from people searching on YouTube. Okay, and there are reasons why you would want to do that and not do that, but the, but the main premise is that Google's the Omni search, as I call it, basically the large search engine that you go to when you go to Google.com, has a far gain, far greater traction of bringing you traffic than does YouTube when it comes to local. Okay, so we would want to take videos that are local videos, stuff that you're using to focus on local, and embedding that on your website as opposed to putting that on YouTube and attempting to garner traffic. Now, if you were talking about, you know. Uh, you know, how to find a great dentist in Arlington, Virginia, just choosing that as an example. Well, we would use that on your website and make it unlisted. But if we were talking about how to choose a dentist generally, right, we would put that on YouTube and make it a public video on your YouTube channel because anybody could use and benefit from that particular video. Make sense? Let me know if you guys have confusion. And uh, and then the other side to that is maybe Vimeo. When I say maybe Vimeo, that's because uh, I've had a longstanding uh, dispute with whether or not <laughs> Vimeo should uh, should be in existence in the uh, in the small business arena uh, because they're not really focused. Their pricing pricing isn't focused on small business. They really aren't really tailored for a lot of small businesses. But for those of you who are creative professionals who do a lot of videography and other kinds of work, Vimeo is a strong platform. So I'm talking to those creative and design professionals who might need or want Vimeo because of the community that's there. Okay, so just depends on on how you're doing things. Also, Vimeo has their own 
way to sell video. So if you are thinking about doing an online course or doing anything video-based where you're selling video, say you're selling a film or a documentary or something like that, Vimeo has its own built-in e-commerce solution. So in those cases, you can actually do that. And again, we're doing the same thing. We are embedding the video from Vimeo onto our own website, and we're putting that behind a paywall. We're putting that behind a paywall, meaning that you can't access it without paying for it, and then you're making a front-end web page or blog posts that market that video so that people come to your website through organic traffic and then they gain access to the video behind the scenes, okay? And then the other flip side is advertising, as I talked about, and there are many, many different ways to advertise, but of course, the biggest way to advertise uh, it, on Google is via Google AdWords itself. So Google really has, you know, many different publishing options for being able to get ads out there, but the vast majority of ads are being displayed through their desktop and mobile advertiser networks on Google AdWords, okay? So if you want to get, you know, sort of inculcated in the advertising uh, uh, schema. I'm sure we'll do future webinars, but I, I know that we, we've done a past webinar on or two on Google AdWords, so head over to the Virginia SPDC org website under live webinars and recordings and you can find the past webinars we've done on Google AdWords and I've walked you through the platform and so on and so forth so you can sort of see what that's all about. All right, so a lot of people ask when it comes to positioning on Google where you should really start. And as I tell every small business owner, you start by Googling your business. And I mean that quite literally. You should be searching your business by its business name, its brand or products or services that you provide so that you can see what your customers and target audience sees, right? You wanna make sure that what they see is the best representation of your brand because you don't get a lot of opportunities after they have a poor first impression of your business to be able to uh, regain them as a customer, okay? Especially when it comes to this kind of, you know, ephemeral mobile searching. People just want to search for the thing they need right now. They need it within the next 24 hours typically, and they're either going to sign on or not based on that reality. Now that doesn't mean that if you're, you know, a, a business where the sales cycle is longer, otherwise you should, you know, throw up your hands. There are obviously exceptions to that rule, but you should really be paying attention to what your business name, brands, and products and services really say about you when you do a search on Google. Are you showing up at all? For example, I've had several business owners who have reached out to me over the years and say, hey, I have this website, I've put it up, and you know, I search my own business name on Google and I don't even rank. What, what's going on? And many times that's just because you haven't even published the website in essence for Google to be able to index and other kinds of things. And I'll talk about a tool that will help you do that at the end. So just make sure you're Googling your website so that you know what's going on. You also want to Im Google important keywords or key phrases with location in mind. Why? Because lo local intent is so important to the mobile search environment, right? So if more than half of people are searching for mobile and more than 80% of them are going to come into a location or buy from that business uh, based on that, we really need to pay attention to the fact that local intent is so important, that 40% of you know, that mobile search is, is local intent oriented, right? So we want to go ahead and, and take those important keywords and attach the location to it, right? So, you know, uh, uh, endodontist, right, you know, uh, in Richmond, Virginia, or I'm looking for a business lawyer in Roanoke, Virginia. Now the keywords and the location source the what we call the uh, the the local pack, right? The um, it's what's displayed on screen for you by Google, uh, either in the local ABC pack or local sponsor pack, but basically that box on Google where you can see local search results. And I can actually pull it up for you, I think, on screen for you to see. But so here goes a search, and I just typed in business attorney Arlington, Virginia, and you can see here that this square that just showed up with the little map on top of it, that is what we call the local pack. And there are various types of local packs, and I'm not going to get into that right now, but, but in essence, this is where you really need to make sure that you show up, and we're going to talk about ways in which you can and should set yourself up in order to do so, but that's the local pack. And uh, you really want to make sure that when you show up in that 
environment that you look good to the customer, right? You want to make sure that you look good and that you that you show up at all uh, and that you look good to your customer. Okay, next up is you want to Google yourself. Uh, many times for solopreneurs, micropreneurs, which is a business under 10, 10 employees, uh, and then small businesses in general, you know, even if you have more than 10 employees, many times you are a figurehead and much of the business is associated with you. You know, if you have a real estate brokerage, you know that each individual realtor as well as the broker really are a brand in and of themselves. And if for some reason, you know, your hobby is something that is, you know, um, fun and interesting or taboo and not particularly interesting, uh, and that stuff is melding together with regard to your business searches, you really need to know that, okay? And you should, you, you can, you know, it's, it's not necessarily uh, bad or wrong that you're doing something hopefully legal and, you know, uh, uh, and that kind of thing, but, you know, if those things are showing up and they're somehow affecting your business, you know, you should know that exists. Okay, and the other side is many times there's wrong information about you online, and it really helps to be able to fix it. Uh, you know, I, I I frequently tell the story about you know when I started my first job, I got a call from the HR director, and uh, first job. Uh, when I moved down to DC and uh, down to Virginia, actually, and uh, they said, you know. Uh, we just have to ask you this question, Ray, but are you a convict in a North Carolina penitentiary? And, uh, <laughs> of course, you can imagine, uh, you know, my, my little green self, uh, you know, very young and, 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 uh, and, and scared of everything was sort of like, oh, my gosh, you know, what, what are you talking about? And it turned out there was somebody by the name of Raymond Sidney Smith who was a, you know, a, a, a convict in the state penitentiary. I think he had died. Uh, he was he was deceased. And uh, lo and behold, you did a Google search of my name, and I didn't know back then that was even a thing. And uh, and there there I was. I was, uh, you know, my name showed up as being this convict. And so I had to go ahead and, you know, talk to the new, new North Carolina state, you know, uh, government and eventually talk to the warden of uh, whatever the name or title of the, of the particular person was. But they were very grateful um, and gracious, uh, you know, for, you know, letting me know that this information was, was on Google and that I was not this person and that obviously I think he had passed away. So they were willing to take that down off of Google so that when people searched for, you know, my name, that it wouldn't show up any longer. So, you know, it's just drives home the point that you never know what's going to show up when you Google yourself. Please do so you know and you can take action against and you know, in the be in your best interest. The the other side to that is key staff. You never know when you have a key staff member who is disparaging the company, who um, maybe also is interacting or engaging in some kind of activity that not necessarily illegal or wrong, uh, but you know, maybe just doesn't necessarily fit the brand and tenor and tone of the company. And there are ways in which you can now, you know, address that so that, you know, maybe the staff member goes ahead and makes their Facebook profile private so that it's not published and, you know, all of their various, you know, sundry <laughs> details of their personal and, and private life aren't published on the internet. Or maybe they have a blog where they talk about something that might be, you know, not quite what you want to be representing your company, and you can have that conversation with him or her and stop the spigot of potentially, you know, rumor mill as well as public relations affecting you negatively. Okay, so where to start? That's really where you start in regard to getting and positioning yourself well on Google is knowing what's out there. Next up is the offline stuff that I think a lot of people really miss the boat on. So you have the opportunity every time someone comes into your, your retail environment, whether that be a, a, sh a store or a, an office, and making sure that they know that you are on Google and that you, they should go ahead and either review you or, you know, um, you know, label your location or update information. You know, there are things that Google wants to know about your business that they're not asking you necessarily. They're asking those people who go to that location. That in can include, is it handicap accessible? Is it, you know, a location that's open during the hours in which people are visiting? 
and how much traffic people are actually you know, having to particular locations at any given time. These are pieces of information that if people are not visiting you on Google, they can't otherwise do. And I'll show you a tool a little bit later on how to actually engage people to visit your Google listing on Google My Business because, or you know, the, the Google Plus page that's set up uh, because it can be somewhat difficult to find. But the idea here is to engage people. You could put stickers up with calls to action. You can uh, make sure that you ask people when they come up to your register. You can put up little you know, uh, displays on your countertops if you're in a retail environment. Obviously, putting those stickers up in your windows. Uh, you know, I have a, a, an attorney friend of mine who has the sticker in her second story window that faces a fairly trafficked uh, you know, avenue. And so when people drive by, they can see it. You can see it right from the street sign. And when you're sitting in traffic, you, you look at the building, it sort of is a little beacon that's right up there, uh, you know, looking at you. And so people are like, oh, that's interesting. That law practice has a little Google sticker. I should check it out. And the, quite, a, quite a bit of people visit her website from just seeing that and checking out uh, their, her services. So think about how you are using offline marketing, putting it on printed marketing materials, brochures, and those kinds of things tactfully, right, tactfully, but you can do it and do it well, okay? So just keep that in mind. All right, so the crux and, and sort of the main substance of today's uh, webinar, I really wanted to spend here in optimizing for Google. And what that really means is spending some time to optimize your website for the various ways in which people visit. And of course, that first way people come to your website is typically going to be mobile. And I, like I said, this is, you know, because it's 60% of mobile traffic, 40% desktop and otherwise, uh, keep in mind that people actually visit your website and can visit your website through many different means, right? So keep these sort of concepts in mind or visualize this. You get up in the morning and most likely the first thing you touch is your smartphone. Okay, you pick it up in the morning, maybe it's your alarm, uh, maybe you check email or check the weather or those kinds of things and see news and, and weather and that kind of thing on your smartphone. By midday and for most of the major part of the day, most people spend their time on a desktop device, whether that be a laptop or a computer, either at the office or otherwise. Uh, then as they go back into the evening, they actually transition to the tablet, the mobile tablet, as being their primary computing device, okay? So you, you almost see this cross-device search pattern when you look at it in the largest aggregate of global search data. And so recognize that people are using all kinds of devices to access your website, but mobile optimizing your website really means that you're, you're accessing the, the vast majority of searches that are happening, and when people look on your desktop site, they're getting a better experience because the pages are loading faster, and the site's responsive, and all of those other things. One really great tool that Google has built is a site testing tool called Test My Site, and this will actually check whether or not your site uh, fits the standards Google has for being able to direct uh, good traffic to you. And so if you go to testmysite.thinkwithgoogle.com, you will pull up a, a page, and if you go to my Twitter stream, I have an, uh, a tweet going out you know, every, every couple of days uh, with that link, so you can go click on it any time and, and, uh, and, and test, and it's a reminder that you should just not test once. You know, you're going to do this test now. You're going to get a series of, of uh, action items to take care of on your website, but don't think that you're done because you know, in a couple of weeks or months, if you come back to it, you're going to need to readdress what issues crop up again, okay? So this is not a test to be done once. So when you see those tweets on Twitter from me, that's sort of your reminder, oh, you know what? I should probably run this test again and make sure that my website is loading properly, it's loading fast enough, it doesn't have any you know, gunk or code that's you know, slowing the site down and causing issues for my visitors, okay? Uh, next up is the start a blog. You should start a blog today you should really have a blog. I cannot, uh, I just can't stress it enough that, that small business owners don't understand the importance of how local traffic can be garnered by making sure that you are blogging about what's going on in your business, in your industry or field, and in your community 
together, right? There's nothing more potent than someone being able to do a search and to know that there is access to that kind of resource locally, okay? And, and that, that runs across the gamut. You know, many, many uh, you know, professional service firms, they attempt to blog and they try to blog on this national perspective of how their industry or otherwise is operating. And what they miss the boat on is the fact that there is lots of information and local stuff that's going on. If you're in some kind of, prof if you're in a profession or if you're in a retail environment with a product uh, you, or service, you are likely dealing with stuff that has local regulation, local policies, local community action, local investment, local you know interaction and engagement. And you should really be blogging about those things. That way your blog posts are creating and garnering local traffic because you know the, the economic development statistics say that you know you get uh, the vast majority of your business, you know, whether it's 80 or 90 percent, I don't know the specific number, from a five-mile radius, okay? So if you're thinking five-mile radius, you know, that's a very small region that you need to be hyper-local and also a specialist in how local stuff is going, you know? So even in accounting, right? What's happening in accounting that's local to your area, right? You know the demographics of your area. Are there primarily agribusiness? Is it primarily urban Retail, is there a really great new Main Street district that has developed? Blog about those things and how that affects your accounting practice, and that's going to be far more effective to you than blogging about debits and credits and balance sheets, right? And that's, that's not that they're not important. You know, accountants should definitely be teaching business owners about income statements and a balance sheet and knowing what and how to read those financial statements, but put it in the context of what's happening in your local community. And I think that will, that will garner so much more traffic for you than blogging about things in the larger context of the industry as a whole. Talk about the industry as it relates to your local chapter of an association, your local business, your local community, and that will get you more traffic. But you need to start a blog. Finally, and I said this earlier, uh, you know, one key word or key phrase per page or blog post, okay? So if you are writing or, you know, launching a new website, then each of those pages needs to have at the very top your primary keyword or key phrase that you're planning on doing. I mean this like if you're writing it in a Word document, preparing for it. Uh, you know, you want to make sure that you write that page or post in with that keyword or key phrase in mind, okay? Which means that you want to use it a few times, you want to make sure that that page has, you know, uh, synonyms associated with it and is of high value. It should answer the question that that naturally would come to mind when someone thought about that particular page. Answer the primary question, which is why I always write, like every page or blog post, I write the keyword or key phrase at the top, I write the suggested title or titles that we've thought of that you know we might use for it, and we write what we call a summary statement, basically a thesis statement for that page. What is that page going to do or answer the question of? And that way, it naturally becomes our meta description for our website page or post, and it gives us a clear target to go for when we're writing that page or post. Okay, just a quick tip. Okay, so make sure that there's one keyword or key phrase you're really focusing that page or blog post on. And finally, minimum 200 words for every page. That's sort of the bare minimum for Google, and that's because that's what actually appears on what we call above the fold in an old uh, traditional media term, if you take a newspaper and you know it's sitting there on the newspaper stand, uh, everything you see when it's sitting there on the newspaper stand is above the fold, right? Then you open up the newspaper, you unfold it, and that's everything else, right? But above the fold is what people come to on your website when they see it. Google's web crawlers, what we call the Google bots, the Google bots crawl your website across the internet. Hopefully they're crawling your website, uh, and they find your website, and they typically look at the first 200 words of your site. That's notwithstanding other parts of your website, your header and footer text and some of the structure of your website behind the scenes. So you're looking at some of those texts as well, but the body of your website, the body um, area of your, of your page uh, should have at least have 200 words. What we know, though, is that the top websites in, in the United States, uh, the average number of words they had was something about 750 words, okay? So know that even longer written websites garner the most traffic, and, and that means across the board. So while you're 
your home page may not have 750 words, the average page or post that is garnering the top traffic on Google, local traffic on Google, has about 750 words, okay? I, I'm, I'm, I know that seems like a lot, um, but it's really not, and I know that a lot of business owners are uh, struggling to create that kind of content, but there are ways in which we can get around that, and maybe we'll have a topic on that in the future. All right, but a minimum of 200 words, all right? All right, next up is about on-page SEO, and I just want to sort of go through this pretty quickly. We've talked about this topic in the past, and uh, but I want to cover these because it's really important. Text styling. Text styling means bold, italics, underlined. Uh, typically, we don't use underlining in and on web pages because that looks like a link. You know, typically web browsers underline a link, so we don't use uh, underlining. But text styling in terms of bold and underline, we want to bold or, or italicize the important keywords on any given page so that people know that that's the important topic of discussion and also it tells Google that that's the keyword, right? So bolding or italicizing is really important. The other kind of text styling is what we call headings. Headings are the bolded titles, subtitles, and section titles of a document. You might know this from Microsoft Word or Google Docs. You can choose text as uh, normal paragraph text, or you can go ahead and make it a title, subtitle, or one of those headings, right, section headings. Well, those headings are what Google uses to understand the archetype and structure of your page, what how your document is naturally laid out, and it also looks at it for whether or not those headings have your keywords in it. So if your headings have your keywords in it, Google notices that, it sees the bolded or italicized words that are also the keyword or the key phrase for that particular page, and it starts to get an idea that, guess what, this page is about those keywords that happen to fall inside those particular bold italicized uh, stylings or in the headings or if they're hyperlinked to another page on your website or to another page on the internet like say if your product or service uh, is hyperlinked on a page and it also happens to be the keyword for that page then Google's going to know that's more important as well image and video optimization what does that mean for image optimization that means using what's called the alt attribute tag okay uh, the alt attribute is basically an uh, is it inside the image tag the IMG tag in your your web web language and, and again you can Google all of this I don't you don't need to worry about knowing this so much as just to know that when you go into most content management systems most website builders and so on and so forth there's a field called alt okay and sometimes it's called description but most often than not it should be ALT all caps just that alt attribute that alt attribute is what Google uses for not only helping people uh, in the Chrome browser for example understand uh, what a, what an image is for those with uh, accessibility needs uh, that is if you are visually impaired you go to a website what Google does is it reads that alt attribute to the uh, the visually impaired person but it also looks at that text to understand what that web page is about and so if the keyword is in that alt attribute that boosts your page up just a little more with video optimization that really comes down to two pieces one is the transcript whether it's closed captioning or, or the transcript of the video and the description and title of the page okay title of the of the video itself uh, so making sure those are taken care of another thing with image and video optimization is the actual file name what is the the actual dot png dot jpg or dot mov or dot mp4 of the actual image and video that you're uploading to your website, okay? Especially if you self-host video on your website, which I don't recommend you do a lot of, but if you do host video on your website, that video name and the image names, so if you have images on your website that are IMG 2554 or you know a bunch of letters and numbers combined .jpg, you're doing yourself a disservice because Google doesn't know what those letters and number combinations are. They want to actually see the keywords and a description of what that video or image is there on your website, okay? So just making sure you're, you're looking at all those different pieces where you can put your, your, uh, your keyword or key phrase. Okay, next up is the local phone number and physical address. Uh, you know, you're, once you put your web page up, you need to make sure that your local phone number, that means local area code, meaning it's a five, 703 or 571. Is there another 
area code, Tracy, that's in uh, Virginia. I think it's 703 and 571. There may be others. You let me know if there's another one that I'm missing. And then a uh, physical address, I'm sorry, and then ex you're, you're exchanged. There are a couple others, 434-757. I mean, in the southern part of the state, you just did northern Virginia. So there are quite a few. Yeah, there we go. So, so thank you, Tracy. So, so you know your local area code. Make sure that you're using your local area code for your local business because uh, 888 numbers, 800 numbers, those kinds of numbers are in, innocuous. They're null to Google. Google doesn't know where those locations are because they're nationwide toll-free numbers. So you want to make sure that you're using a local area code and the local exchange, if you have a hyper-local business, which most people do, uh, you should really be paying attention to the next three numbers. Area code is the first three numbers. The exchange is the next three numbers that appear in your phone number. And that actually tells you uh, it's, it, they're a bit like zip code based, okay? So it actually tells you where those, those businesses are located down to the neighborhood. So you should really pay attention to what those exchanges are. Now, I know you're, I'm gonna get a lot of questions, so I'm just gonna answer this now. Don't worry if that's not the case, then you have a number where you've changed locations or if you have a, you know, a number where you don't have a, you know, an exchange that matches your neighborhood. That's all well and fine. I'm just telling you the ideal practice is to have an area code and exchange that matches your state, region, and then your, 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 your area, your region, locally, your neighborhood. That's the best, okay? Not everybody's going to be able to do that. Next up is physical address and making sure that you use, um, I put that link on the screen to schema.org. Now this is a little technical, but again, either talk to your website you know, designer or developer to help you get this stuff done. But if you read the schema on schema.org for local business, it will give you all of the appropriate tags that you have to put into HTML to make sure your page shows as the appropriate address and phone number and name of your business. Uh, this includes hours of operation and other kinds of data as well in the schema local business uh, information. But you want to make sure that your business uh, is and is properly coded so that Google can see what information is available to you. And if you put it in the header or footer of your website, uh, you want to make sure that information is appropriately uh, tagged so that Google can see that that's actually your business information. If you have a physical address, that's great. If you do not have a physical address, then you at least want a place that you serve, you know, uh, Northern Virginia, you know, including Arlington, Alexandria, and Fairfax and Loudoun County, or if you're down in the southern part of the state that you service, you know, uh, Roanoke or Hume or um, Danville or, or otherwise. You want to make sure that you're listing those particular regions, Lord Fairfax, or if you say we, we serve the Blue Ridge, you know, mountain areas. This gives Google some clues, at least into where people might be able to use you as opposed to not. The, the number one or two local ranking factor for that that what we call that um, the the little area on that I showed you on the Google search engine results page, the local pack, that the number one or two search rank factor, they sort of flip flop, is the location, the vicinity of the searcher to that location. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the 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 search intent, right? So if I type in, as I said before, uh, business lawyer Arlington, Virginia, is basically the the closeness to Arlington, Virginia to that search is, is one of the number two or number one ranking factors to it. And then of course, uh, Google understanding that your citation, your listing on Google My Business matches that location, okay? So it's looking for the closest business to rank it. It doesn't even look at content on your website. It doesn't look at any of those other pieces. It's just looking for the closest business not even the highest review, not even any of those things. We're, we're seeing a, you know, sort of the, uh, the first ditch effort, right? Google is going to provide the closest business, all right? Then it starts to look at when you have competition, it then starts to look at the other ranking factors, number of reviews, the, the rate of the review, the, the ranking of the review, whether it's a higher or lower review. Uh, then it's going to look at value of the content and those other things um, uh, next up. But really, it's just looking at your physical location, your physical address, and knowing, is this closest to the person searching for it? And so that makes it really, really powerful and important that you, vital even, that you make sure that your schema is correct, okay? Next up is the idea of creating what I call hyper-targeted local pages, okay? And this is one of the most difficult things for me to explain, so, I, so bear with me now. This is the idea of creating pages 
that are independent of your website in the sense that they sit on your website, they're hosted by your website. The only difference is that they do not appear in the navigation bar, okay? So they are not in the site's nav bar, as we call it, okay? But they talk about each of the cities or towns or neighborhoods that you serve, and they start with the page that already exists. So for example, if you have a page called services, right? You would have a page for services in, you know, Charlottesville, Virginia, right? So services Charlottesville, Virginia, that page would not be in your nav navigation bar, but it would be a new page that sat in your website and then opened up, it would, uh, Google has a 20% rule, which is that any, the 20% of the page that it looks at, that first 200 pages, 20% of it needs to be different to make it what, we, what it considers original and not duplicate content. So we take the first couple sentences of that, that page, the services page, and we write in something unique to tell people that they are doing business in Charlottesville, Virginia. These are services that are provided to Charlottesville residents. And you can talk about the university there, you could talk about local business you know, issues or those kinds of things that make it tailored to Charlottesville. And you can do this with then every page on your website and having multiples of these. So to say that you service multiple cities. So that individual, so on your services page, you have multiple services, each of those services pages, you could in essence create a new page three times or four times over, each of them tailored to having original content in that first, you know, that first 200 words, 20% of it being, you know, original or new content that talks about the locality. And that way, when someone does a search for a Charlottesville business attorney, well, they're going to find that page if there's a, you know, an attorney services we do, you know, uh, we do not business plan review, but, um, but, you know, membership LLC agreement reviews in Charlottesville, Virginia, right? So their main page might just say, you know, membership LLC agreement review, and that's their services, that, that one of their individual services page, but now they have an an, another one that's created for just Charlottesville, then maybe another one that's just for another city or just for another city. And again, those don't show up in the nav bar, but what it does is it creates a, a far more pages for Google to be able to index and locally optimize for someone who is searching specifically for that region and for that service at once. Okay, so feel free to ask me questions. I'll, I'll do my best to answer uh, that as I can, but that's a really, really powerful way to create some on-page search engine optimization uh, for um, garnering a lot of traffic through Google's local search. Okay, so then the uh, one other thing that I, I tend to talk to businesses about is telling them that you should really be embedding maps on your website with your business marker on it. So Google uh, allows you to be able to go to Google Maps, uh, which is the platform on which Google My Business sits, and uh, you can create a business marker map, basically a little, you know, that little red marker that shows your business. It shows up in different colors for different reasons on Google Maps, but for the Google Maps embedding, it shows up as a red, little light red uh, marker. The business marker can then be placed on, say, your locations page or on your contact page, and that way someone can click on it, automatically be pulled over to Google Maps or run directions or see hours of operation or those kinds of things from the Google Maps uh, you know, your Google My Business listing that's sitting on Google Maps. Having that embedded Google Maps is very, very powerful because Google knows that you chose that location and then put it on your website, and therefore, that's where your business must be. And so it's very, very powerful if you put the embedded Google Maps map on your website with the business mark. Okay, so go ahead and do that. Uh, next up is really some, some general tips for Google My Business. Now, Google My Business is a tricky beast, and so again, I really recommend that folks who have individual questions about what's going on on Google My Business to go to g.co forward slash gsbc, that link I showed you on the first slide or second slide, and, uh, and ask those specific questions because you sometimes run into some issues. But some things that you should generally think about when it comes to Google My Business. One, is be on Google My Business. I don't understand the number of business owners who tell me I don't show up on Google search, and uh, and it turns out it's because you haven't gotten yourself listed on 
Google My Business itself. So if you go to google.com forward slash business, you will then log into your Google account, and that could be a, a business email address where you create a Google account with it or Gmail account, and get yourself listed. Complete the information and get yourself verified and go through the process of making sure that you've completed all the fields appropriately and honestly and making sure you're on Google My Business. Not every business is allowed on Google My Business, so just understand that, you know, I'm sorry, not every business is going to get a Google Maps listing because you're not a local business, so understand that some businesses that don't serve a clientele, you know, uh, directly in a retail or an office location, those kinds of things, you don't provide your services directly in there, you're not going to get a, a, a Google Maps listing the same way everyone else does, but you should still go to Google My Business and go through the process so that it connects your Google listing to your Google Plus page and so on and so forth, even if it's not there. It's still important, okay? Make sure that you add a unique description when you go into Google My Business. So what happens, most people do is they copy some part of their website over to Google My Business and they just copy it over and uh, copy and paste and go on with their day. That description should be unique because Google sees, sees it as its own page. It sees it as its own content. And if it's duplicate content from your website, then that's very confusing to Google. Okay? Uh, make sure that you pick the correct categories for your business when you do set it up. Upload photos and even YouTube videos can go into that Google My Business listing. Please use those. And make sure that your profile image, whether that's your logo or a, a picture of you and your staff or some other kind of image, is consistent. You want to have a consistent image and brand for that. So if someone comes to Google My Business, goes to Google Maps and does a search, and they see an image that is disparate or different than the website that they visited about you, that could be very confusing and will cause loss of trust. So you want to make sure that those are consistent images. Uh, make sure that you have your open and close times and days of operation Op, uh, you know, uh, updated. Uh, one of the biggest problems with people is that they go to a business and it's not updated, and you need to update those for holiday hours and so on and so forth. So you're going to get pretty intimate and comfortable with logging into and using Google My Business because you need to update it. Make sure people know, okay, it's Memorial Day that just passed. Were you open or not? And that means someone was frustrated when they came to your storefront and it wasn't open or your office and you weren't open. You should tell people that and that means getting those things up, up to date. Uh, one of the important things on Google My Business is getting reviews, right? So like I said, you know, the most important thing is your physical uh, location and if you don't have a physical location, you can tell Google on Google My Business, I satisfy this region, this area of uh, you know where I operate and it doesn't expose your actual physical address so you cannot expose it uh, but the 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 next couple of ranking factors down are reviews and uh, and so you need to make sure that you're getting reviews and uh, one way to do that is to ask customers to review you so a customer comes in the front door you provide them services they've had a great experience you say hey would you mind reviewing our business, giving us some feedback. And you can do this by invoice that you, in your invoice, when you email it to a client, if you're a service-based business and you want to go ahead and send an email invoice, you can have a little line in there that gen, gen, you know generates reviews by asking people for feedback. Don't ask for five-star reviews, don't ask for a great review, just ask for honest feedback, okay? And so you get people to go ahead and do that and you send them the link. Now, Getting to that link can be sometimes pretty difficult, but this really great program called uh, the Google Review Link Generator that's created by a company called uh, Whitespark. Uh, they're a California-based company. I'm sorry, a Canadian-based company. But if you go to this URL that's on the page here, it's whitespark.ca forward slash Google Review Link Generator, and that has all hyphens in it. But it's whitespark.ca forward slash Google review link generator with hyphens. This great tool allows you to go in and put in your map information, you know, find your business on the map, and then it generates a review link. So it's really, really great because it used to be a kind of bit of a pain to uh, find this unique link for getting Google reviews. So again, whitespark.ca forward slash Google review link generator, all hyphens. And if for some reason uh, you didn't catch that, I will be happy to repeat it when we get to the end. Okay, so we have uh, we have 
reviews coming in from, from customers, and hopefully they're good reviews. When they're not good reviews, obviously you want to go ahead and address those and, and uh, appropriately ask customers to re-review once you've corrected whatever the matter was. Okay, So this generally gets you um, pretty far with Google My Business and getting yourselves on. Now, the next are pretty much the big four problems I see when customers come to me and say they're not doing well on Google My Business. Okay, so what are they? The first is citation, or what we call NAP, name, address, phone. Inconsistency, so what's a citation? A local citation or a citation is your listing in some kind of business directory online. That can include Yelp or Localese or one of the other major, the Universal Business Listing uh, Service, any of those major services, which is why you should Google your business, like I told, told you to do at the start. You Google your business, you look for those kinds of uh, citation inconsistencies because if your business has an old address in one place and a new address in another and Google sees that, they can't be confident in sending business your way so they're going to not show your your name in the local pack or in any of the searches in the Google Maps because they're not going to be able to trust that someone's going to go to the right location. And when someone goes to the wrong location, they have less trust in Google, and that means they don't use Google as much. So citation and name, address, phone consistency is so important. You should really create some kind of alert mechanism to constantly be searching for your name, address, and phone to show up in searches, and when they do, to make sure that they're correct. And I'll talk about a tool that you can use um, in a couple of minutes. Um, next up is duplicate GMB listings. You should really make sure that you don't have duplicate listings. Basically, Google yourself and make sure, Google your business name and make sure that you don't have multiple listings. Uh, poor on-page optimization. I just told you how to increase your poor optimization. You should really work on your on-page optimization. and That does mean going page by page through your website and making sure that it ranks well, or at least is optimized well. You won't always rank well, but you'll at least know that you've done your best to be able to do that. And finally, our Google My Business violations. Okay, so this comes down to this page on Google, and this is the guidelines for representing your business on Google page. And the most important thing you need to remember here is this number up here. It is answer number 303-8177. I send people to this page all the time. Okay, so just write down 303 8177. This is the support document that will go through all of the guidelines for being on Google My Business. If you violate this, Google will not even tell you that you have violated it, but guess what? It will penalize you and you will show up less in the Google My Business searches, in the Google Maps searches, okay? So make sure that you read the document, you know the rules, and you follow the rules, okay? And that way Google will not keep kicking you off, okay? Um, there are several things that you can do in order to uh, get backlinks for your website. I'm going to jump over those right now, though, because we are running out of time. And I just wanted to talk very briefly about monitoring tools with Google so that we can go through those. And, and I'll be happy to, I'm going to throw the, um, the, that page that I put up that I just sped through, I'll put that in the link um, in the in the video so you guys can just review them because they're pretty easy, um, self-explanatory. Okay, next up, uh, we're gonna talk about monitoring uh, with Google using Google Analytics, using Google Alerts, Google Search Console, and the Google My Business Dashboard. So these are just four tools that Google provides to you so that you're able to uh, basically access the data that you need and really start to make some good business decisions. So first and foremost is Google Analytics. Thank goodness the new user interface is here. So the last time we did this, the new user interface was just starting to roll out, but now you will see a much simpler navigation. You'll see reports, they'll make sense. You'll be able to get a lot more data from it, but go ahead and check out Google Analytics by going to google.com forward slash analytics and then you will be able to access the data. If you're not already connecting your website to Google Analytics, please do. That way you'll be able to see information for who's visiting your website and from where, and that really ends up giving you a lot of really great information about whether or not you're getting the right traffic. So if you have a website in, you know, somewhere in Virginia and your business is coming from those people who live in that community and you're getting lots of traffic from people from Istanbul, well, you're doing something wrong and Google Analytics will be able to tell you that, okay? Next up are Google Alerts. What I talked about earlier about 
uh, basically citation or NAP or NAP inconsistency, name, address, phone inconsistency, you want to set up some alerts to make sure that when your name shows up on Google, you get an email or your address or your phone number shows up on Google so that you can make sure that it's consistent with what is actually your name, address, phone number. You accidentally mistyped a phone number somewhere, you mistyped an address or an old address shows up on Google, you want to make sure that you are alerted. Google.com forward slash alerts set up the search, and then they email you. So go ahead and do that. Uh, next up is Google Search Console. You get to that by going to google.com forward slash webmasters, and you will go ahead and add your property. You'll do that by clicking on the red Add a Property button, and then it'll walk you through verifying your website. And this is what will tell you whether or not you're being indexed by Google. When I What I said at the top of the webinar, whether you're being indexed by Google, whether or not Google knows what's going on, or if there are any problems with your website, including malware attacks or other other kinds of uh, scams that are going on. Um, if your website's been affected, Google Search Console will go ahead and tell you. Again, google.com forward slash webmasters. And then finally, the Google My Business dashboard. Again, you go to that by going to google.com forward slash business, and then you'll click on the uh, link that says, show me my listing. If you're listed, if not, then you're going to add your listing and go ahead and follow the instructions for being able to do so. Um, and you'll see the red circle will be the card where your business will uh, show up in your location, and you'll be able to manage the information like hours of operation and phone number and address and so on and so forth there within Google My Business. So um, I'm going to let Tracy take over now. We can uh, do what we need to do to close out. I'm happy to stay uh, for Q&A. I just put my email address up on the screen. If you have questions that are more specific uh, about Google My Business or other types of tools, I'm happy to answer those questions afterward. And Tracy, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Ray. I think we'll go ahead and close out since we're at um, just after 1.15, and then I will go through the questions. There are quite a few of them. Thanks, everyone, for participating today. Today's webinar was recorded and will be posted on the Virginia SBDC website under Live Webinars and Recordings. Tomorrow you'll be receiving an, a follow-up email on the webinar, and there'll be an evaluation link in the email. Please help us to continue to improve our training by taking the time to complete the evaluation. I'm also posting that in the chat window so you can um, do the evaluation now if you'd like to. And our next webinar is June 29th, e-commerce basics for retail small businesses, point of sale, e-commerce and commerce solutions for small businesses. So I'm going to go ahead and, and run through um, the questions. Um, we had one about the Google Maps. Do you use a third-party widget or use Google in the body um, when you embed a map? You will use Google itself. So Google generates that map. And uh, so, so if you, you have questions about that, just shoot me an email again, and I can direct you to the specifics um, for doing so. Uh, or if you just in the google.com forward slash business, Google My Business dashboard, there are links somewhere in there, and it's not coming to my mind the exact breadcrumb to get there, but you can you can create those those embedded uh, links within the Google My Dash My Business dashboard. But if you can't, shoot me an email and I will I will send you the link for being able to do so. There's been much attention to you to utilizing GMB, but are there any tips for someone that does not does most of their business online through e commerce? There's no actual brick and mortars address to my business. Right, so you should really be focused on making sure that your Google Shopping listing is is basically feeding into Google Shopping, okay? So if you're doing e-commerce, uh, you should be really focused, you know, again, we talk about Google Omnisearch, I, I at least call it Google Omnisearch, I don't know what other people call it, but basically Google.com, when you go to that Omnisearch window, you know, there's the blinking cursor in a box, uh, you are, are searching across the entire paradigm, the entire platform of Google, but Google knows when someone has an intent to search and buy something on an e-commerce website, website, and you know, if I type in I, the typical example I give are uh, men's loafers, right? I type in men's loafers. Google knows I'm looking for shoes to buy, most likely, right? And uh, or not the fact that it's fairly underreported that men, you know, loafers once upon a time were. Uh, ambidextrous, you used to wear both shoes on either foot. Uh, but anyway, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you go ahead and make sure that your website is designed to feed your e-commerce products 
into Google so that it can index and appropriately garner that traffic for people who are looking for that. Now, the good part is that you can also local optimize that. You can say that, you know, these shoes are the best walking shoes in Alexandria, Virginia. And that way, when someone is doing a search for those types of things, they can do that. But also remember that you need to, to make sure that the website as a whole, header and footer, have that schema.org forward slash local business stuff in it so that that code in it so that they're able to know that they can purchase those shoes, they're in stock, and that they're available in the locality that you're in. Great. Um, how can I find the blog readership, the number of readers, followers of a blog? I'm interested in finding this out about certain influencers in my field. Sure. So a really great way to do that is to use a tool called Feedly.com. It's not the primary reason why Feedly exists. It's actually a, it's a blog reader, you know, so it's a feed reader. You can add websites to it. When you search for a website, say if you, you know, go, you take, take the blog that you're interested in learning how many followers they have, this will give you an estimate, which is to type their URL into Feedly and as though you were adding them to the blog. And actually, when the blog shows up, if it identifies the feed, it will say, you know, XYZ blog, and this has X number of people following it. And so you can see that that blog has X number of followers before you follow it by virtue of doing the search within Feedly. Great. That was the last question. Thank you everyone for participating today.